The Hermit of Devrayan Durga by Kenneth Anderson He was called the Hermit because in many ways he resembled one, both in the choice of his abode and in his eccentric habits. For he was an unusual tiger, although no man-eater and never once accredited with eating human flesh, he was of a particularly ferocious disposition and very hostile to the human race. He killed three people, two men and a woman, within the short space of five days, and all on the impulse of the moment and out of sheer aggressiveness. Further, his habits were unlike those of a tiger, in that he ate goats and village dogs, which tigers rarely do, especially dogs. And then again, he suddenly appeared in the scrub jungles, clothing the hill of Devrayan Durga, six miles from the town of Tumkur and within fifty miles of the city of Bangalore. Devrayan Durga had not held a tiger for many a decade, being the home only of a few wild pig and peafowl. The area did not boast a regular forest, but was covered with very ordinary scrub jungle of lantana bushes and wait a bit thorn. Moreover, the hilltop was very rocky and held a few small caves. In these, an occasional small panther was known to take up residence, ousting the previous occupant, usually a porcupine, by the simple expedient of devouring it. But the caves hardly provided sufficient shelter, let alone a safe hiding place for a large animal like a tiger. The whole area was but an island scrub among flat, cultivated fields, which no normal tiger would ever risk crossing either by day or night. But this is exactly what the hermit did. For cross these fields it must have done to reach the doubtful and scanty shelter provided by Devrayan Durga Hillock. At first, no one knew that a tiger had appeared. The few villages that are scattered in the area began to suffer the loss of an unusual number of goats and dogs, and the loss was ascribed to a panther, till the tiger's pug marks were picked up one morning, traversing a ploughed field near one of these villages. Within the next two days, a large cow was killed that had been left out to graze all night within the hitherto safe outskirts of the village. The owner of this cow, an old woman, was very attached to the animal, and when she heard next morning that it had been killed, she proceeded to the spot a quarter of a mile distant where she squatted down beside her dead protégé and commenced to weep and wail aloud, calling heaven to witness the great sorrow she felt and the loss she had suffered with the death of her beloved cow. The other members of the small family had accompanied the old lady to the spot, and had sat around a while in silent sympathy to listen to her weeping and wailing. But they soon grew tired of it, besides having other things to do, and one by one they returned to the village, leaving the old woman alone beside her dead cow, still weeping with unabated vigour. It was now eleven a.m., and a bright sun shone down on the scene. No ordinary tiger would have returned to its kill at such a time, in that glare and heat, and to a place disturbed by such noisy wailing. But the hermit was not an ordinary tiger. This tiger did return, and saw the old woman beside the kill, rocking herself to and fro while she cried aloud. The beast concluded that this noise was intolerable and must be stopped. So out it sprang on the old woman, and with a simple blow of a paw put an abrupt end to her life. It then dragged the cow some yards away and ate a hearty meal. The body of the old woman was untouched, and her existence apparently forgotten by the tiger. When she did not return by 4 p.m., her family, judging that she must have exhausted herself with weeping and fallen asleep, came to the spot to take her home when great was their surprise and horror to find that she had been killed, while the tiger had made a hearty meal of the dead cow and returned into the brushwood. Rushing pell-mell back to the village, they spread the sad news. Soon the headmen of the village, armed with a muzzle-loader and accompanied by two dozen stalwarts, carrying a miscellany of hand-weapons, came to the spot. They then attempted to follow the tiger's trail, but not for long, for the animal had entered the dense scrub jungle quite close at hand. 
Being too afraid to enter the brushwood, they commenced to shout lustily and throw stones, and the headman discharged two musket shots into the air. Nothing happened, and they turned back in order to carry the body to the village. When out rushed the tiger and pounced on the last man of the party, the unfortunate headman, and incidentally the only member of the group to carry a firearm, he was dead before he became aware of what had happened. The party broke and fled to the village, and only late next morning did they return in great force to recover the two corpses, both of which had been untouched during the night. The tiger, however, had made a further meal of the cow. For the next two days, consternation reigned supreme. On the third morning, a traveller approached the village from Tumkur, driving before him two donkeys laden with a variety of goods. A mile down the road from the village, the tiger pounced on the leading donkey, which collapsed beneath its attacker. The second donkey stood still, while the traveller, with a scream of terror, ran down the road whence he had come. His action appeared to provoke this extraordinary tiger, for it chased and killed him, and then returned to the dead donkey, which it carried away and ate. Both in chasing the man and on its return it had passed the second donkey, which it did not even touch. The body of the man remained uneaten. These incidents, occurring so close to Bangalore, were headlined in the local press, and next morning I left for Devrayan Durga by car, reaching the spot in just over two hours. Questioning the frightened villagers, I was told the story as I have just recounted it. The weather being dry and the roads dusty, all pug marks had disappeared by this time, and for a short while I was disinclined to believe that the marauder was a tiger, thinking it more likely to be a large and strangely aggressive panther. The men who had accompanied the headman, however, and had witnessed his attack and death, assured me that it was indeed a tiger. Nevertheless, knowing how prone the villager is to exaggeration, I was still in doubt. After a short lunch, I spent the afternoon, accompanied by an obviously nervous guide, in scouring the surrounding area, poking among the caves, and tiring myself out completely in looking for the hermit, but never a trace nor a pugmark did I come across. At 4 p.m. I returned to the village and with great difficulty procured a half-grown bull as bait, no buffaloes being available in this area. This bait I tied about three-quarters of a mile from the village, at a spot where the road was crossed by an extremely rocky and thorny nala. It was now close on six o'clock, and as there was no time to erect a machan, I decided to spend the night at the traveller's bungalow at Tumkur, six miles away, and return next morning by which time I hoped the tiger would have killed the bait. This I did, waking at 5 a.m. and reaching the spot where I had tied the bait by about 5.30 a.m. It was just growing light when I stopped the car a half mile down the road so as not to disturb the hermit if he had made a kill. Approaching the spot cautiously, I found my bait had disappeared. Closer examination revealed the animal had been killed and the tethering rope severed, apparently by deliberate and very vigorous tugging on the part of the slayer. Pug marks were also visible, and these showed, first, that the killer was a tigress and not a tiger after all, and the second, that this was an adult animal and large for a tigress. Remembering the stories I had been told of the peculiar nature of this animal and her disposition to attack suddenly, I followed the drag very cautiously, scanning the area ahead and on all sides most carefully at each step, looking behind me, too, every little while. Progress was thus very slow, but the drag was clearly visible, nevertheless, and in 150 yards I came upon my dead bait. The tigress apparently had moved off. The young bull had been killed in the usual tiger fashion, its neck being broken. The tigress had then carried it to the place where it now lay when she had sucked the blood from the jugular, as was evident by the deep fang marks in the throat and the dried blood on the surface. She may then have left the kill and returned later in the night, or settled down to a feed right away. 
The tail of the bait had been bitten off where it joined the body and left at a distance of about ten feet. This is a habit normal to most tigers and generally to big panthers also. Finally, the stomach and entrails had been neatly removed to a distance of again about ten feet, but not near where the tail had been left. The tigress had then begun her meal in the usual tiger fashion from the hind quarters, eating about half the bait. From all these facts it was therefore apparent that the tigress was not, after all, the very strange and eccentric animal she was reported to be. She just appeared to be a particularly bad-tempered female. Hoping that she might return, I climbed a scraggy tree that grew about twenty yards away and was the only cover available for my purpose. Here I remained till 9.30 a.m. No tigress appeared, but on the contrary, the sharp-eyed vultures from their soaring flight above spotted the kill, and I soon heard the rattling sound of the wind against their wing feathers as they plummeted to earth for the anticipated feast. To save the kill from being consumed, I was therefore compelled to descend and cover it with branches broken from the adjacent bushes, afterwards returning to the car and making for the village. Here I procured the services of four men and came back to the tree, where I instructed them to put up my portable charpoy machan, which I had brought with me in the car. By the afternoon all was ready. One of the men then suggested that, as the hermit was particularly fond of goats, I would considerably increase my chances of bagging her if I tied a live goat in the vicinity. The bleating of the goat, he said, would surely draw her to the spot even if she had decided to abandon the half-eaten bull. Thinking that there was something in the idea, I motored back to the village and soon returned with a half-grown goat of the size that usually bleat vociferously. After some biscuits and tea, I ascended the machan after instructing the men to tie the goat only when I had taken my place. Thus the goat would feel it was alone and bleat loudly as soon as they were gone. It was about 2 p.m. before the men finally departed, and very shortly afterwards the goat began to bleat in really grand style. This it kept up intermittently till about 5.45 in the evening, when I heard the tigress approaching by the low, moaning sound she occasionally emitted. The goat heard this too, stopped its bleating, and faced the direction of the sound, while its state of stark terror was pitifully visible as it trembled violently from head to foot. Most unfortunately, the tigress was approaching from behind me. Though my charpoy machan provided ample room for me to turn around, the trunk of the tree itself, and a clump of exceptionally heavy, wild plum bushes that grew nearby completely obstructed my line of vision. Moreover, the ground sloped steadily downwards from the direction in which the tigress was coming, and this probably caused her to spot my machan while she was still some distance away, being on a level with her eyes from the higher ground down which she was approaching. Or it might have been the extraordinary sixth sense, with which I have noticed some carnivora are particularly gifted that put her on her guard. Whatever it was, that tigress sensed something suspicious in the surroundings, and that danger lurked nearby, for she gave vent to a shattering, snarling roar and began to encircle the whole area repeatedly, roaring and snarling every little while. The unfortunate goat almost died with fright and the last I could see of it as darkness fell was a huddled, trembling patch crouching close to the ground. That extraordinary tigress made the night hideous with her roars until about 9 p.m., when, with a final snarl, she walked away. Thereafter, nothing happened except for a sharp drop in temperature towards the early hours of the morning, when it became intensely, miserably cold. My teeth chattered in the tree, while those of the goat chattered down below me to a slower rhythm, but more audible, or so I believed. Dawn found us both exhausted after a sleepless night in the freezing cold. The goat was, moreover, so hoarse after its vigorous bleating of the night before, followed by the exposure, that although it opened its mouth in an effort to make some noise, no sound was forthcoming. 
I spent two hours at midday looking for the tigress without finding a trace. I then selected another tree, this time of a leafy variety and overlooked by no rising ground, where I erected my machan into which I ascended by 4 p.m. with another goat tethered below me. But this goat was as insensitive or as callous as the one of the night before had been sensitive and nervous. For with the departure of the villager who had tethered it, it settled placidly down on the ground to chew heaven knows what, which it continued to do until darkness hid it from view. This time I had clad myself more warmly, and by midnight, closely wrapped in my blanket, I fell into a deep and dreamless slumber to awaken at dawn, to see that most placid of goats still chewing, again heaven knows what, as if there was not a single carnivore in the whole wide world. Again I searched for the tigress at noon, and again I failed, and again by 3 p.m. I was up in my machan, this time with the young bull as bait below me. It was seven o'clock and almost dark, when unexpectedly a party of villagers carrying a lighted lantern came from the village to tell me that the tigress had killed another cow only half an hour earlier near the bund, or embankment, of a small tank a furlong from the village but in the opposite direction, and was engaged at that very moment in eating it. Considering it a waste of time to remain, I therefore descended, and, instructing the men to leave the bait where it was, on the off chance of the tigress passing in that direction later in the night, hastened after them towards the village and the tank. Once we reached the village, I instructed them to extinguish the lantern. I then took only one of them as guide and advanced towards the tank. My companion whispered that the cow had been killed on the left of the road, hardly fifty yards from the verge and just a furlong from the village. It was pitch dark by now, and with the villager close behind me, and walking down the center of the road, I switched on the torch which was mounted on my rifle, and began to direct it to my left. There was a snarl, and a woof, and then two large red-white orbs shone back at me from a distance I judged to be within two hundred yards, and at a slightly higher level. I was puzzled by this last factor till the villager whispered that the tigress was standing on top of the bund of the small tank. Walking along silently in my rubber shoes, with the villager following barefooted behind, we made no noise whatsoever. Meanwhile, the tigress stared back at the light. In this way, I advanced down the road for more than one hundred yards, till I reached the place where the tank bund joined it. We then turned left and commenced the slight ascent to the top of the bund. The tigress was now about one hundred yards away, and began to growl. I stopped, and was in the act of raising my rifle to my shoulder for a shot, when her courage gave way, and she turned tail and bolted along the top of the bund in three or four leaps, after which she descended to the right on the far side of the tank and was lost to view. We then walked along the top of the embankment, shining the torchlight down into the tangle of scrub. A large, solitary banyan tree grew there, and great was our surprise when the eyes of the tigress reappeared at a fork in the tree, quite fifteen feet or more above the ground, and level with the top of the tank bund on which I was standing. It was surprising, because tigers generally do not climb trees to such heights, especially when followed by torchlight. I could now make out her form clearly, squatting dog-like in the crotch of the tree. Taking careful aim between the shining orbs, I fired. There was a loud thud as the tigress hit the earth, followed by a coughing grunt and then silence. We walked along the tank bund for some distance, shining the torchlight into the tangle of bushes below the bund to our right, but not another sound did we hear. Knowing that my bullet had struck the hermit, I decided to get some sleep and return next morning. Accordingly, we retraced our steps to the village and to the spot where I had left the car, a mile away and beyond where my bait was secured. At Tumkur, I ate a light dinner, 
washed down with some strong tea and a pipe load of tobacco, after which I turned in for the night with the highest hopes of being able to pick up the tigress in the morning. I was back at the village at daybreak, and, collecting my assistant of the night before, we were soon on the tank bund from which we very cautiously descended the sloping ground to the foot of the solitary banyan tree in which the tigress had been sitting when I fired my shot. Our attention was immediately arrested by blood splashed over a wide area where the animal had hit the ground in falling off the tree. Looking about, we then found a segment of bone, about a square inch in area, in which a part of the lead of my point four zero five bullet was embedded. By the sharp claw marks on the tree trunk, we saw the way in which this extraordinary tigress had pulled her great weight up the tree to attain the fork. My companion soon climbed up nimbly to the same place and found a few drops of blood in the fork itself. We then began, very cautiously, to follow the blood trail from the banyan tree, and it was soon apparent that the tigress had been hit in the head and was severely hurt. The blood spoor zigzagged about aimlessly, going in a narrow circle and recrossing itself several times. She was obviously in a stunned condition, or perhaps blinded, and did not know what she was doing or where she was going. Frequently we came on large pools of clotted blood, and finally to a spot where the tigress had fallen, or probably lain on the ground for part of the night. The whole circle, roughly ten feet in diameter, was red with blood. When she had moved away, evidently in the early hours of the morning, bleeding had almost stopped, and only an occasional drop marked thereafter a wavered path into the dense undergrowth of lantana, grass, and wait-a-bit thorn that clothed the foot of the embankment. First of all, we encircled this belt of undergrowth, right to the end of the long embankment, some two hundred yards away, and back again along its upper end, but there was no blood trail in any direction or trace of the tigress having left this cover. She was obviously, therefore, somewhere in this belt of dense undergrowth, which, as I have just said, was about two hundred yards long, and varied in width from about seventy-five yards to barely ten. But was she dead or alive? That was the question, and on the answer depended the lives and limbs of my companion and myself. Returning to the spot where the last drop of blood indicated the place at which the tigress had entered the undergrowth, we then began systematically to beat the area. My companion and I, standing close together, hurled stone after stone into the massed vegetation, but only complete silence and stillness greeted our efforts. We progressed in this fashion along the edge of the belt of undergrowth. In hopes of getting the tigress to show herself, I fired five rounds in all into the lantana, but without response from the tigress. About three-quarters of the way along this belt, a low tree, a dozen feet in height, stood out from the surrounding bushes. My companion slipped towards this and began to climb it with the view of obtaining a better view, when, without warning, out came the tigress with a single roar, and scrambled up behind him. The man screamed with fright, while from my position, barely twenty yards away, I fired three rounds into the tawny form before it toppled backwards into the lantana. The hermit was dead at last. The tigress, as I had judged, was an old female with blunted fangs, her age had probably forced her to seek easier living in the proximity of man, where there would be goats, dogs, and cattle for easy killing. Hunger and old age probably accounted for her quick and vicious temper, but lack of courage and an inborn aversion to man had prevented her from actually becoming a man-eater, although I have little doubt that she would have eventually turned into one had she been allowed to continue her career unchecked. Incidentally, my bullet of the night before had struck her on the bridge of the nose, but rather high up, removing the piece of bone we had found, but at the same time not entering the head of the animal deeply enough to kill it. Indeed, it had actually ricocheted off, carrying the piece of bone with it, so that it was just possible the old hermit might have recovered after all, despite the vast quantity of blood she had lost, 
had she not disclosed herself by attacking my companion as he climbed the tree. The End <laughs>